Welcome back. Matt Barton here with the first in a new series of interviews with Trent Oster. And now you might have known Trent from his work at Beamdog, a company he co-founded and <laughs> runs as the CEO. Uh, they're the uh, folks that bring us all these uh, uh, collector's editions, enhanced editions, Neverwinter Nights, Baldur's Gate, uh, Icewind Dell, you know, all the good uh, Infinity Engine Aurora games. Uh, but he goes back further than that, all the way back to uh, Bioware, uh, which he co-founded. And he's uh, one of the primary people responsible for Neverwinter Nights, uh, amongst many other games. Uh, really great stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, he's got some great history, as well as uh, ideas uh, that are very relevant to anybody uh, wanting to design a role-playing game today. Uh, in this first part of the interview, we chat about uh, some of his other interests. Uh, we talk about sports car racing. We talk about real-life weaponsmithing. Uh, and then we get into Neverwinter Nights uh, and the uh, new Moon Sea uh, premium module uh, for Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition. There's just a ton of great stuff here, and I think you really get a kick out of it. Anyway, a lot of stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Trent Oster. All right, folks, I am here today with a great Trent Oster. He is the CEO of Beamdog. He's a former Bioware, or he's a former Bioware co-founder. He's a serial entrepreneur engaged creator, occasional weaponsmith, which I definitely want to get into that, <laughs> and just uh, an enthusiastic human. How are you doing today, Trent? I'm doing pretty good. Yourself? Ah, doing great. You know, I was uh, not aware. I was doing a little research on you. I came across all this stuff about your stock car racing, or, or sports car racing, I should say. Are you yeah. still, still keeping up with that? You still, it was a Mazda, right? A RX-7? Yep. I had an RX-7. Um the fixed to fun ratio kind of went bad on that for a while where the car was breaking down fairly frequently because I had basically modified everything in it and it had gotten so far away from what Mazda originally thought the car should be and what I thought the car should be. So uh, I actually parked it and I raced Spec Miata for a couple of years, mainly just to fix. I was getting sloppy as yeah. too reliant on horsepower and, and big brakes and Spec Miata really smooths you out. You have to be really precise and really focused on it. So I ran Spec Miata for a couple of years, just uh, sold that off last year, and then uh, just thinking about what to do now. Yeah, I had a Mazda Miata back in the day. It was they a are really fun. fun car to drive. I would pull it out onto the track at the beginning of the season. I would just nut the gas, and then it would be like, I think it's broken. And then about 10, 10 15 seconds later, I was like, no. That's all it's got. It's a Miata. We're good. Is that a fairly common sport for uh, game developers? I've, I remember I've talked to a couple folks that have done some form of I, car racing. I think it, it kind of ties in with that entrepreneurial mindset mm -hmm. where you just want to do things that are they're fun and competitive and challenging. And racing sports cars, especially when you start moving through some of the more some of the more complicated rule sets, it's about finding little little loopholes and optimizing. And then you're competing on the car build. You're competing against their driving skill. And you're also competing against their maintenance and planning. So it's it's just this multi-level competition. So it's it's pretty engaging. Oh, yeah, that sounds really cool. I had a game back in the day. Uh, was it Street Rod? Okay. Play that one. <laughs> it just had just enough of that. I think there's one out now called something like Auto Mechanic Simulator. Oh, God. You ever seen those? I, I feel like I could get really get sucked into that and maybe <laughs> eventually start. I don't I know, maybe try to change a carburetor out or something. Yeah, I, I just spend about half my time going, okay, what was, the, what was the guy who, what was the company that built the car thinking when they did this? Okay, they're wrong, and I'm going to change it now. Yeah, you make it sound like it's not really all that different from a game engine or a, it's, it's like, basically a hard, the, like putting a PC together. It's kind of similar in terms of it's it's a bunch of systems. They all interact in a specific way, and and to make something faster, you can each you kind of upgrade each system kind of in parallel. And uh, as as my friends and I kind of joke about, it's it's the race to find the weakest drive train component. It's like oh that broke okay fix that with something better okay that broke now put something better in there. 
Every repair has to be better than the part that failed. Every repair has to be better than the part that failed. That sounds like a great mantra. <laughs> it, it's uh, it can get expensive sometimes because sometimes the parts you're replacing are like okay, Mazdas when you go above about 350 horsepower tend to blow up transmissions. What can I do for a transmission? Yeah, my, that's a small problem. That that would be a small concern there. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to get into this weapon smithing because that's wow, real life uh, like anvil, forge the uh, whole thing. I mean, what are we talking about here? Anvil Forge, uh, Forging Press. Uh, I just uh, restored a 1918 uh, Meyer Brothers Power Hammer. So it's a little 25-pound little giant. It's uh, it's pretty amusing when it's hammering away. So I've, I've done a couple things so far. Um, I usually do – lately I've been doing a lot of chef's knives, mostly for friends and family. Um, I've done a couple bigger things. i got a sword on the go right now. Sword, swords, yeah. are, swords are <laughs> that's so a, that's much That would have work. been the first thing I would have gone for. <laughs> so you probably better work. start off with a knife, maybe. That's, that's probably oh, yeah. You should make something tiny off the start and then just kind of slowly move up. But the the last – so the sword I'm making is uh, it's basically a hand and a half sword, bastard sword. I think it's about 53 inches in length. And uh, it's, it's quite light. I've shaved it down pretty far, so it's maybe a bit too light. For a, for a really good heavy sword, but uh, it's it's made out of Damascus. So when I'm finished with it, it should look pretty awesome. Yeah, the Damascus. I was wondering about that. So yeah, so the, the Damascus is a lot of fun because you basically start with two pieces of two different kinds of steel. You can even go three, but I haven't done three. I've just worked with two typically. You go one that's kind of a normal high carbon steel, and then you get one that's kind of got a higher chromium or nickel, higher nickel content so it actually will resist an acid and then you you forge weld them all together and when you're done it just looks like one piece of metal but then at the end of the whole process you take it and you dip it into acid and the acid will eat away at the at the normal steel whereas the higher nickel content will resist it so then what you have is this, this kind of uneven surface that's that's tapered away you run some sandpaper over and the shiny stuff the the stuff that wasn't etched becomes shiny and the other stuff stays quite dark wow. and it actually makes for some pretty interesting looking stuff yeah i mean all i know about weaponsmithing i learned from conan the barbarian <laughs> <laughs> i always think you know it's kind of you get this guy banging on a piece of metal yeah uh, but i didn't realize i guess there's a lot of science and chemistry and it's, it's about half science half art and uh, a lot of it is just learning how things behave in the certain con conditions, different steels, they like to be worked at different temperatures and they react differently. If you, if you go into the quench too hot, they become really, really brittle. And then you have to kind of temper them down by heating them up to a lower temperature so the grains can kind of realign. And it, it's really neat because you're, you're essentially manipulating the molecular structure of the steel for this desired outcome by, by using heat, by using a cooling system. And, and like I've got... I use canola oil as one quench oil, and then I've got a... Canola oil? Uh, just regular yeah, canola? Regular canola oil. It works good for steels that like slower uh, slower quench. And then I've got a fast quench oil that I use for other steels. And the fast quench stuff you need for pretty much any of the good Damascus stuff or any of the big tool steel stuff. I've got a couple weapons behind me oh, in my office. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look at those. So like what do we got? Fun. So I was practice grinding... And I made a kukri. Yeah, the kukri. So kukri is pretty cool. So this is actually forged out of a leaf spring. I was looking for one of those. I was playing Neverwinter Nights 2 recently, and I was okay. need the kukri for my critical strikes. I, I, I didn't I didn't like kukris. I didn't think no. – I thought they were just kind of weird. Now what it's is, like a weird uh, what is this? It's supposed to be good for what, like a, um, mainly like a for machete chopping. type weapon? Yeah. So what I found is the geometry of them is amazing for chopping. When you chop into something, chop. it it just got a really nice forward weight to it and hits really hard. So that's pretty simple. And what I got this this is just kind of a, a long shank Bowie, but you can't quite see too much of the detail in the steel. But it's it's what's called a, a ball bearing Damascus. So what I've done is I've taken steel ball bearings and I put them in with steel powder. And then I've heated them up and I've welded it together into one piece of steel. 
and then I've drawn out the metal. So the ball bearings kind of smear out, and it almost kind of looks like snake skin. Yeah, that is weird. And, uh, I notice you kind of have a curved handle on it. If I'm yeah, I curved that one. Just look at that handle. There's a little bit of a curve, looks like to it. Yeah, I, I seem to like the curved handles. They just kind of fall into the hand better. It fits fits nicely. And then that's a, uh, that's a knife. Yeah, and I made a I made an elvish dagger. So this is oh, this cool. is kind of your your Aragorn elvish dagger. Look it's uh, Damascus that. on the. Yeah, it's Damascus. It's highly polished up. It's got brass and uh, love a, that blue handle. The blue the blue and the brass really go oh, nice yeah. together. And uh, it's got a, a big weight on the end. Like the, the pommel is actually quite heavy. So it has a really nice balance to it. I like that one quite a bit. And I actually probably, the, this is probably like the fifth thing I ever made. Do you name your blades? I, I haven't. I haven't yet. I haven't made one worthy of a name yet. And I got an axe because everybody's got to make oh, an axe. Oh, look at that axe. Yeah, That's the a perfect axe is a rat chopper. It's it's fun. It's a it's a fun little axe. I've played with it a bit. I haven't thrown it because I'm I'm worried I'll break it. <laughs> <laughs> that is too cool. So now you're about to yeah. make your first sword. Yeah, the sword is about halfway done. I've got the I've got the cross guard fit on there. Now I just have to make the actual handle itself. Figure out how I'm going to attach the pommel, and then. I'll wrap the hilt with, with whatever it is, and then I'll take the blade out and then etch the blade, and then I'll reassemble the whole thing and put it together. Yeah, you know, I'm sure somebody's probably thought about this before, but it sounds like this would all make for a great game just in and of itself. It would. I'm just worried that the hardcore enthusiasts would be so hardcore. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> they would know the chemistry, and they're like, okay, I know I need 1,550 degrees Fahrenheit for this. So you'd have to, you'd have to be – legit so that they would appreciate it but then more casual fans would be terrified by just all the intricate knowledge and the twiddling you got to do it's like okay this is a this is this steel so it needs a three separate one hour temperings at this temperature and then i got to go into uh, some cryogenic <laughs> cryogenics oh yeah, I mean, these yeah, are people that are complaining about Neverwinter Nights crafting system being too complicated, right? Yeah, <laughs> You're like, you don't know anything. <laughs> real life crafting is way harder, way harder. And and the sad thing is, in real life crafting, you've you've bought like eighty dollars worth of steel. You've spent hours and hours and hours working on it, and at the end, when you quench it, it can all just go wrong. I made uh, I made one knife that I, I made, and it wound up looking like some kind of Urukai weapon. <laughs> It was, the blade was just weaving. Not intentional. It was just mangled. Uh, yep. Well, that was that was probably a cursed a cursed item. Then. Yeah. <laughs> it's cursed by the blacksmith. Dagger dagger minus two, wavy bladed uh, breaker, will smash when hit on something. No, I don't. It's, wanna, it's, it's, yeah, it's been gonna, a fun hobby. You focus I've on the it. weapon smithing. Have you thought about? Maybe helmets or shields or plate mail, something like that. I've looked into it, and I've, I've actually, when I was is probably sixteen, we had a friend who was in the SCA, oh, and uh, sure. and my father was a welder, did a lot of metalworking, and we we actually repaired some of his armor and built him a couple pieces for it. So I know the basics. Well, I know. Let me let me restate that. I know how we approached it, and I know what we did <laughs> to make something. And when I say we, it's me and uh, me and my older brother. And uh, we just used a tree stump and a, and a ball peen hammer and just beat it into a tree stump to get the shape out of it. We didn't worry about cleaning it up that much. It was a little lumpy when we handed it off, but it worked. Yeah, this is. We could talk about this all day, really, but <laughs> I just, you know, I just love this uh, kind of kind of discussion. Uh, well, let's uh, jump on though to the uh, Beam Dog. You know some of the latest news. I got a lot of sure. a lot of people were asking about things, and I, I took a look uh, just before I got on. I wanted to see what's the, the very latest stuff on the Beam Dog uh, pages, and I saw this new premium module uh, for Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition: Tyrants of the Moon Sea by I think this is this is Ossian Ossian yep. Ossian uh, Ossian yep. Ossian Studios twenty plus hour. High-level adventure set in the perilous Moon Sea region of the Forgotten Realms. New monsters, new tile sets, 35 minutes of new music, and 1,000 lines of new character VO. 
That's got to be. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's that's wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Ossian is actually headed by Alan Miranda. So Alan Miranda was on Neverwinter Nights. He was my producer. He handled all the audio and the, the voice recording and everything. And then after Bioware, he went and uh, moved out to Vancouver, where he's been essentially running Ossian since then. They made a, a couple expansions over the years. Um, one of them was for Atari, and it actually got canceled. And we actually managed to bring uh, Darkness Over Daggerford back and let Alan and his team kind of finish it up. And then we got talking, and we were like, hey, what else should we do together? And he was like, I, I think we can do this Tyrants of the Moon Sea. And I was like, sounds interesting. Let's let's figure it out, man. Yeah. So we got together. We chatted about it. And uh, months passed, and here it is. It's pretty awesome. I, really? I'm going to grab that. <laughs> as soon as we're done, I think I'm going <laughs> to head straight over there and pick that up. Yeah, I just finished uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, Mask of the Betrayer. Okay, yeah, that's Alan's work. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't even need a sales pitch, really. It's, it's there. It, it's it's out. <laughs> yeah, the Austin guys do good work. They they oh. definitely really love RPGs, and I think by focusing on like building the content and not having to build an engine and like building within an existing framework, they're able to focus on kind of those core things that make RPGs great. Whereas, I mean, my career has been kind of a combination of fighting technology and still trying to craft the RPG that I want. Yeah, that's, that's something that's come up a few times on this show, talking to, I talked to a lot of CRPG designers and developers, and we're, you know, I guess people have different takes on the importance, like should the, are you better off if you do have some control over the game engine, the design, that sort of really fundamental stuff, or are you better off coming in later you know, once the engine is there and you've got great user tools, construction kits to work with. And, you know, I guess people just, uh, just depends on your personality type, I suppose. I think there's a couple things. I think one, by building the engine from scratch, you can really optimize around what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. So with Neverwinter Nights, we were able to kind of approach it top down and say, okay, we want this to be an adventure, just like pen and paper D&D. You've got your one character, the other people join in and they form your party and you adventure together and we're going to we're going to have a, an adventure that's contained in a module you're going to sit down you're going to play it for a short period of time have a great time together and then at the end of it if everybody's happy you can decide to go on another module so we really we really looked to pen and paper for that inspiration and we built the engine with that in mind and at that time i mean there was no engine that did anything like that it's so much easier now to kind of grab like a, an Unreal or a Unity and say, okay, here's games that have done 80% of what we want. Let's go down the path that they've already paved, and now let's work on the, the added 20% mm -hmm. that we, wanted, we want to add on top of that or take it in our own direction. And that's where the pain is. Like if, if For those engines, when somebody else has built a workflow or a path, it's very easy to follow it. But if you've if you're building a workflow from scratch, it's kind of a nightmare. You're like, I want to do the thing. Yeah. How do I do the thing? And the answer is usually not in an intuitive way. I need to figure out what the technology and what the engine, how it wants to do things, and then try and fit what you're trying to achieve inside that framework. You know, I often think as, I think it was Isaac Newton that said something along the lines of, if I've done great if I'm a great person, if I've done great things, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And, you know, I kind of think about that. It's just like the modern designer. They can stand on the shoulders of people that built all these. Like the Neverwinter Nights construction kit, for example. But but on yeah. the other hand, it's kind of cool to be one of those giants. <laughs> yeah. it, it's kind of hilarious because we did the hard thing. Yeah. And it was so hard. Like, we actually scheduled in Neverwinter Nights with this whole timeline where, okay, and here's where the tool set is done. And here's where we use it for the first time and decided it's a piece of junk. And here's when we replace the user interface because we know it's going to be horrible. We had uh, literally two full months in the schedule of just redoing the user interface for the tool set because we knew our first kick at it would, would baffle most people. And yes, it totally baffled most people. Some of our designers included. I think even me included. Well, <laughs> I just was... Uh counterintuitive i suppose or we we did awkward. a really deep dive into this kind of the the idea of a template versus an instance a template being kind of a a container which could hold all the properties of something and then when you when you took a template 
and created an instance, the template changes would, would, automatically, prog- uh, would automatically move on to the instances. We had done it in such a convoluted way that it made no sense to any humans. When we redid the system, we wound up with the template instance system, which is mm-hmm. if it's just data, it's a template. If it's a thing in the game that you can see, it's an it's a instance. So template is just data, instance is a critter on the screen. Once we kind of made that mental shift, everything's made so much more sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was still confusing. Well, it turned out really well because, you know, a lot of people recommend uh, to people that aspire to make a CRPG, uh, instead of trying to make it from scratch, play around with this Neverwinter Nights construction kit, get a a good feel for that, uh, and then you can go off and do whatever you want. Uh, And I even talked about that a little bit in my, I got a book, uh, Dungeons Dungeons and Desktops, that came out not too long ago, and there's you know, of course, I think one of the reasons people buy a book like that is they want to make their own game. So uh, I still think it's good advice. Take a look at those, uh, you know, not, maybe even some of the other modules, user modules mm-hmm. and things, and, and learn from that. But it, it kind of brings me to something I was wondering with the relationship between the tabletop and the desktop role-playing game worlds. Because I remember back when I bought Neverwinter Nights uh, 1 and 2, you know, it never would have occurred to me I need to make my own module. <laughs> it just yeah. wasn't, didn't have any conception of that. Uh, but now that I've kind of uh, been playing more and more tabletop D&D, I start to see it's a different focus. Like those folks really like the idea of making their own stuff. It's a lot more of a creative uh, performance, I suppose, than, than the computer. So, I mean, how do you see that relationship between those tabletop experiences? Well, I, I, I guess computer? when, yeah, when we played pen and paper we literally would we'd buy one or two modules we'd play them through enjoy them and then of course we'd want to run off and and do our own settings and do our own our own stories and our own everything and it was just so much fun creating your own universe and your own story and your own plots and characters that i kind of thought you know I, i think this is magic i think people would love this and and the idea that it's not going to be everybody who loves it, but those people who love it will create content that can be shared across multiple people who can then jump in and, and, and enjoy it. And we had a lot of internal fights during the development of Neverwinter. It's like, okay, we're going to make the same tool set that we're going to use and we're going to release that to the fans. So they're going to be able to do everything that we can do. And I, my whole attitude on that was, if we're professional game developers, we should be really good at what we do. We should be able to outperform what these fans can do. Oh, they were worried that the fans would turn out better. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was, that was one of the concerns. Wow, it was one of the, one of the real concerns. Another was like the idea that the tool set could open the modules that we shipped. It'd be like, oh god, we're sh- we're showing off our secret sauce. And and again, my kind of attitude on that was, our secret sauce is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to make a good yeah. RPG and a good story and a right interactive dialogue. Will there be people out there who are great, the answer, who are better than us? And my answer to that was, I hope so, because if they create something amazing, we should totally find those people and hire them and use them to make our people better. And that's that's kind of how it worked out. Yeah, I mean, for, for a good five, I'd say almost 10 years, it was kind of like the standard hiring process at Bioware was, oh, you want to be a technical designer? Okay, where's your Neverwinter mod? Oh, you don't have one? That well, you should build the one and show it to us. That was part of the application process or the interview yeah. process. Wow. And there was a, uh, uh, two designers who joined Bioware, uh, Georg Zoller, who was from Germany, and Jaren Jacobs, who was uh, from Israel. They sent in these modules, and our guys looked at them, and they're like, I don't, I don't know how they're doing that. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I don't get what they're doing here, but it's like the engine shouldn't be able to do what oh, it's doing. Oh, that is so cool. And uh, they both worked there, each of them, for probably a good decade. Did you let on that you didn't know how they were doing it? <laughs> oh, totally. At the start, the instant they joined the company, yes, everybody was very... like, how'd you do that thing? We didn't we didn't think it would do that. And, uh, of course, both of them were very logical, very, very engaging people, explained how they did it. And everybody's like, whoa, you're really good. Yeah, I'm glad you're on our team. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking back. I remember some of the older RPGs. Of course, you had the Bard's Tale construction set, and I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. I know there must be more than that. They're just not coming to mind immediately. But it just seemed like Neverwinter Nights. For some reason, that was the one that kind of exploded. I remember people 
even back then were saying, look, even, you know, get this because you're not only getting this official campaign, but you're basically got unlimited modules you can download that are all free. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's just incredible. It was, it was pretty amazing for its time. And, and then as well, it's like, if you've ever wondered how an RPG is built, here's how an RPG is built. Like everything's there. You can take a look at it. You can pull it up. And, and like creating any standard RPG, we made the tool set pretty easy to use initially. Anybody can fire it up, create an area, drop down a critter or two. Mm-hmm. But then when you go to actually make a plot or something, it gets hard because you've got to start scripting. You've got to like, okay, I want this guy to go here, 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 here. Oh, and I want a dialogue. Okay. And gee, you know, I got to think of the people who might be speaking to this character. Well, well, what if one of them's a bard character and he's really... He's Han Solo the Bard. Oh, I need some dialogue for Han Solo the Bard. Well, what if this guy's a straight-up paladin? He's he's literally like, you are either good or you are dead. So how do I write for that? And then you've got completely different set, the, the magic user. Maybe, it, maybe you're trying to, trying to fit, okay, I need a good magic user and I need an evil magic user. Suddenly, you're looking <laughs> at this complexity wow. just balloon out and you're like, Okay, this is really hard. <laughs> There's a reason. You know, maybe I don't need it. dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> just, I'll just, I'll just kill lots I'll of. I just have a rat in there, you know. <laughs> yeah, I remember playing around with it, and I was, uh, I saw the thing where the, I think there's like a uh, what they call it, a sample, you can yep. bring up and look at this, and I saw all these like lines going from the monsters and characters. I'm like, what's that? Oh, well, that's the paths that you can set up for them to move around. I was like, oh, you know, I never really thought about this part of the game. But, yeah, this, somebody had to tell all these. <laughs> you know, I mean, it kind of gave me an appreciation I didn't really have before for just like, whoa, this is way more work uh, than I ever would have imagined. I mean, it's amazing yeah, it's, any of this stuff gets made. It was kind of the joke of the industry at the time in terms of right about the time of first-person shooters getting ready to ship. You're ready to start writing and scripting an RPG, so you got another year and a half of dev time yet to go. It's the reason not a lot of people were doing RPGs. There's, there's that extra just straight story and script and and just the the conversations are so involved that mm-hmm. it's just that extra level of crafting that goes beyond. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with part two of this interview. Believe me, the good stuff is yet to come. Uh, just <laughs> so many great topics here. I'm really looking forward uh, to making these videos. I know you're going to uh, get a big kick out of uh, Trent, so stay tuned. Uh, the best is yet to come. Uh, let's see. What about that? Oh, <laughs> I want to start by thanking you. Uh, thank you very, very, very much for making this episode making this interview with Trent uh, Ostier possible could not would not do it without you uh, so thanks so much for your support of this show uh, remember if you want to support the show I don't ask for much uh, one buck an episode will do it uh, just fine uh, just go to that link in the show notes to the patreon site uh, you can sign up for a buck an episode you only get charged when the episodes come out or if you're feeling generous to two bucks five bucks you know whatever you're comfortable with uh, whatever the show is worth to you, I really, truly appreciate it. So thank you for that. I uh, also wanted to mention, um, well, just kind of uh, before I get to the news, some kind of cool stuff. One of my uh, viewers uh, wrote in requesting a hardback version of Dungeons and Desktops. This is the uh, second edition I co-wrote with uh, Shane Stacks of uh, ShanePlays.com. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to show you this. <laughs> if you... I mean, the hardcover, I think it's about $100 for these, but, you know, it, it's absolutely amazing production values. Uh, full color, of course, on the inside, but this is basically made for a library, so it's, you know, I could probably, you know, bang this up and down, uh, and it would be fine. I'm not going to do that because we're keeping it in uh, premium shape uh, for that viewer. But anyway, I just thought I'd show you this. If you want to get a signed copy of that, just let me know, and we can set it up. Uh, Basically, what I do, order it myself, have it sent here, sign it, and then ship it to you. And we figure out what the shipping is. A little more expensive if you're overseas, obviously. But, uh, you know, if you really want the best of the best, there we go. And also, you know, I realize I don't really ever talk about my books at all. <laughs> it's just kind of crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought I'd briefly mention these, some of my uh, previous books uh, so they can get a little uh, attention as well. Vintage Games 2.0. 
Uh, this is uh, another second edition. Uh, this is, you know, we did a book about vintage games. It's basically the top most influential games of all time. Sonic the Hedgehog is in here. Doom, of course. Uh, the original Dungeon Master, Pool of Radiance, uh, Tetris is in here. Uh, so this is a really solid book. Maybe if you got some friends or, you know, that are more interested, more broader interested than just uh, role-playing games, you uh, should get them that. Then, of course, Honoring the Code, which is a, basically a Matt Chat book. You know, I went through and transcribed a bunch of the interviews, like uh, John Romero's in here, John Hare, uh, Howard Scott Warshaw, Chris Taylor, Chris Avalon, Brian Fargo. And I think even if you watch the videos, there's something about reading it uh, that, you know, gives you a new perspective on it. Uh, you know, it's just not the same as just watching the video. And then finally, I got Vintage Games Consoles here. Uh, this is co-authored with uh, Bill LeJudas. And I think this is probably one of the best books, you know, about the uh, the hardware. Uh, so if you want to know about the history of DOS, uh, for example, the Intellivision, uh, the Atari 8-bit, uh, VCS, Apple IIs, uh, NESs, you know, what have you, uh, you're really going to like this full color, lots of great photos. And again, something I think makes a good gift you know, uh, you probably you might know all this stuff, but if you have a, a kid maybe uh, that you want to share some of your history with, uh, get them a copy of uh, vintage, uh, vintage Games Consoles. And remember, any of these books, if you want to uh, sign copies, uh, just contact me. We can work something out uh, over email or, uh, you know, from Amazon. But anyway, just thought I'd mention all those. I'm not going to do that every video. <laughs> uh, but just in case, you might not even know I wrote those books. So uh, there you go. All right, what about that news? For the Matt Cave. All right, got some good news here. Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition Tyrants of the Moon Sea. This is the uh, module we I talked about here with the Trent. Uh, checked it out on Steam right before I'm posting this. It's currently $9.99. That's $9.99 on Steam. You do, of course, need Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition to play it. Uh, reviews very, very solid, uh, especially complimentaries or compliment, yeah, compliments on the uh, pacing of the game. Very uh, it sort of pushes you right into the action right away. No long, slow buildup. Uh, also, everybody's raving about the voice acting on this, which that's a big plus. That's an easy thing to go, <laughs> that can go horribly uh, all right. Uh, one of the comments, uh, one of the reviewers named Taro94 wrote this, quote, this is definitely a must buy for Neverwinter Nights fans. For those of you who played Darkness Over Daggerford, the short review is, it's just as good, possibly better. So, so there you go. Go check it out. Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition, Tyrants of the Moon Sea. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, in other news, The Outer Worlds has released a new trailer. Uh, this is the Halcyon trailer. Uh, you can watch this, of course, on YouTube. It looks really interesting. I, I, I've been kind of following this game. I'm kind of excited about it, but I think this trailer has kind of stepped it up a notch for me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm kind of thinking maybe this is what they... Uh, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this without being offensive to uh, Bethesda. <laughs> There's no, uh, no way to do that. Uh, anyway, I just think if you like that sort of Fallout vibe, but you maybe uh, didn't like uh, Fallout 76 or some of the later Fallout games, I think you might want to check this out. Uh, it's definitely got some uh, some similarities, but I think the differences are what makes it really interesting. Anyway, obviously I haven't played it yet, so uh, who's to say? But I'd love to hear your thoughts on The Outer Worlds. Is this something you're looking forward to? <laughs> Are you dreading it? <laughs> you know, what What? What do you think about it? And then finally, In Exile, one of my favorite companies, they are. They have released the Bard's Tale 4 Director's Cut on Steam. Now, if you already got Bard's Tale 4, this is free, which is cool. Now, otherwise, it's $34.99 for Standard and then $49.99 for Deluxe Edition. And it's got a new dungeon called the Royal Necropolis of Harrenhold. Uh, they've uh, toughened up the bosses, added some dwarven weapons, full controller support, and, quote, thousands of fixes. You know, I didn't really have uh, any issues with the game <laughs> to start out with, so, <laughs> you know, that sounds really encouraging. Uh, they've also added this, and what do you think about this? A new song of exploration called The Struggler's Lament. Lament. Struggler's Lament. 
And what that does, whether you just want to explore and fight or if you get stuck, simply play this song to skip the mandatory puzzle. So <laughs> you guess, uh, you know, for people that thought the puzzles were too hard, you know, I thought the puzzles were the probably my favorite part of the game. Really, really I had some fun with those. But, but anyway, if you don't like that, you can now play Struggler's Lament and just sail right past them. Anyway, that is, uh, again, Bard's Tale 4, Director's Cut, now on Steam. All right, that'll do it for the news, and let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes about about crafting and, you know, getting it right and being determined uh, to get the job done, you know, quotes along those lines. And I just found this one here, and I, I think this is just so good. It's really inspiring. I wanted to share this with you. It's by George Herbert, and it goes something like this. Do not wait. The time will never be just right. Start where you stand and work with whatever tools you may have at your command. And better tools will be found as you go along. I don't know about you, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really just kind of makes my uh, uh, makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There we go. Very encouraging stuff. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy that, and see you next week.